So we welcome you to our topic today, Customer Survey Success. My name is Melissa, a success enthusiast here at SOGO Survey, and I sat down to think about a good number of topics to talk about around <laughs> customer survey success, and we know that that's a long list of things that you might be doing. And certainly it depends who your customers are, what industry you're in, what their experience has been, what kind of product or service you provide. There are lots and lots of different variables. Um, but I wanted to start by drilling down some of the top tips that we could um, suggest to you in this area of customer surveys. And then to dive in a little bit to the platform, uh, we'll start with a survey bank survey in there and apply some of the things that we've talked about, or at least take a closer look at them. So first a little bit of theory, and then a little bit of practice, which is a lot to do in 30 minutes, a little bit ambitious, but of course you know that there are, are a lot of follow-up materials available for you um, in our user guide and in the videos that we have as well, and we'll be also happy to take those questions as we go through and as we wrap up today. So I picked out five key uh, items for you. And so from the top, those are branding, not a surprise. You know, I do love the alliteration, so you're going to see build your brand beautiful. Um, we know that that makes a huge difference. We've got a couple of different things to talk about in that area. Um, meet your market. Again, this is <laughs> alliteration gets a little bit excited. But um, the idea of knowing who your audience is, sometimes you already know a lot of information about them. Sometimes you have to. Um, drill down by asking them specific questions, but the more specific you can be, um, the better quality data you're going to be able to have, and the more easy it'll be to um, make some next steps out of that, uh, out of those results. Which brings us to basically the last of our items here. All these three are related to that. Uh, what do you do with your data? So the first one, there are answers you can use, making sure that when you're asking questions, uh, it seems really obvious, but that the data that you end up with is actually actionable. A lot of times questions are just sort of nice to have, um, or they give sort of soft responses that are just kind of nice to know, but you, it's really difficult to apply. So I'll take a talk about those for a few minutes. Um, and then data that's its own reward. Uh, we love to see numbers. We love to see statistics. Infographics are increasingly popular um, on social media, online, everywhere. Um, people like to cite those kind of statistics. And when you create your own statistics, um, you have something for benchmarking, you know, against yourself and across uh, certain industries as well, too. And finally, the last thing is, what are you actually doing with that data? Um, are you following up with your participants? Are you collecting more feedback on the results? Uh, you know, obviously, it's not a vicious cycle, but it's just a cycle that keeps going, um, especially when you're working with customers. Those are people who very often have changing opinions over time. Um, as your customer base shifts or grows or ages or, you know, develops into having more um, you know, different priorities along the uh, along their timeline. So it requires you to make some changes as you go. So it's not an end process where you just ask your customers what they need and they give you one answer and you're done forever. Of course there's a cycle that's implied in that. So starting up at the top here, again, we'll take a look at just some of these things at the high level, um, and then we'll dive a little bit more into them on the platform. Um, we can spend some time on any of the items that stand out to you as needing a lot of explanation. Um, but starting with a brand, so very, very obviously put on here, looks do matter. We know this is a huge deal for businesses. Um, we know this is a huge deal for just about everyone um, to make sure that you do have your logo, you do have your style, um, not just the visual, but as well the style of content. Um, so that means here probably you have a style guide that dictates you know, what kind of uh, you know, impression do you want to create with your customers? Do you want to be a sophisticated, smart, savvy brand? Do you want to be fun and accessible? Um, a lot of the styles that you've made, uh, style choices that you've made, for example, on your website or in marketing and communication materials, those are the kind of style choices you want to keep consistent with your survey. If you have a font that you always use, like if it is Proxima Nova on your website like it is on ours, like that kind of thing you want to be consistent with. You, of course, the logo is a simple starting place, but there's a lot of other options that you have when we get into visual settings, making sure that you have all of those fonts the same, making sure you have the right colors matched by hexadecimal code. And if you're somebody who knows your hex code by heart, that probably is a good indicator <laughs> that you want to make sure that you're using that here as well, too. Um, another thing to think about is uh, when you are doing an outreach like this, of course you're creating some sort of experience with your customers as well. And you do have the ability, even though of course uh, we're asking for information, providing data while you're collecting as well. Um, so you do have a lot of different options for doing this, such as um, 
of course, you've probably put out an announcement or you sent them an invitation. There's a reason that they got there. Um, but if they've just found you on their website, uh, on your website, excuse me, you probably want to have at least a little bit of information at the top. What is this all about? Um, giving, of course, some purpose to, you know, why are you collecting it, but also talking a little bit about yourself, too. Um, the data that you put out there can be just as valuable as the data you collect. So you're creating that impression that, you know, we're knowledgeable, we have information to help you, we have a lot of um, products or services to offer, um, and even sometimes just exposing people to those um, new products, for example, like when we launch our CX platform, we're pretty excited about having that out. Just letting people know that that's coming, I think, um, is going to be a, a sort of an opportunity when you have that new product or you have something that you want to inform people about um, that can be very, very useful for you to put out into the world and sort of see who bites. Um, also, if you're asking a question, asking for um, providing some information up front can be very helpful if you say, you know, for example, you've you know, you're changing your logo, let's say, you want to be able to say that, you know, we've had this logo for how many years and, you know, this is the current impression. We wanted something that would, um, you know, convey the following such and such requirements of our brand and which of these three do you like? You know, which of these three do you feel represent that idea? Super good idea. You could use an image choice question, of course, but giving people that upfront information can be very, very helpful in, you know, collecting informed data. You know, if, if I say to you, uh, do you like my shoes? You know, that's not very <laughs> I don't care if you say yes or no because you don't even know what my shoes look like. So making sure that you're collecting informed uh, responses is going to give you a lot better quality response. Um, last thing there, matching your invitations, of course. Um, when you spend all this time making a nice looking survey, spend the same time making a nice looking invitation so they matched. Um, you, know, ha you know, hats and gloves and shoes, whatever you're trying to wear, just do the whole thing. Uh, the whole package here should match and it gives you that in positive impression with your clients. Next up here is meeting your market. So um, a lot of different options, again, as already mentioned. We want to get to know the right people. And if we don't already know, we need to ask because we want to be able to um, take a look at that data based on um, those segments or based on the conditions that apply. So if it's demographic information that really applies to you that you think is going to be important, you know, what do people of different genders think? What do people of different countries think or in different, um, you know, sort of market segments based on however you'd like to define them? Um, that can be really, really helpful information, and you know you need to include that in your survey. Uh, so the first one I had there is the demographic data that can be pre-filled. Um, just keep in mind that pre-population is a really, really great feature. We've talked about this in a lot of other uh, webinars because <laughs> I think it's a really important feature. Um, happy to talk to you more about that, of course, too. But demographic da data can only be pre-filled if you already know that information. Um, and so making sure that you are collecting the information and then preserving it, you know, in your database, whatever it is that you're using, so that you can pre-fill. Why should I ask people? which package they're signed up for. If they're a Sogo Survey client, for example, I already know that information, so I should be able to pre-fill it so that I don't have to ask, hey, what, what package do you have? Like, I already know. Um, so I don't have to ask an irrelevant question, but I can still collect that data, so then when I look at reports, I can divide people who have a trial account, people who have a basic account, et cetera. So getting to know that market, if you aren't able to pre-fill it, that means asking questions. So that means asking, you know, which of these packages are you signed up for? If I ask you, you know, you're signed up for a trial account, I might ask you what kind of trial account. So relevant follow-up questions. This goes to question display logic. Um, this can even go to branching. Maybe this is an even more broad survey. Maybe this is just on our website. And my first question is, are you a SOGO survey customer? Um, in that case, I'm going to have some specific questions for you, like, you know, what package do you have? How happy are you with your service? And if you aren't a SOGO survey customer, I guess my question would <laughs> be, why not? But probably the better thing to ask is, you know, what would interest you? Um, and the relevant follow-up questions, um, you know, again, it's only appropriate for a certain audience. So making sure that either you're getting to know your market or you're pre-filling the information that you do know, um, making sure that your reports are as valuable as possible. Okay, next one here is ending up with information that you can use. Um, when we have this, we have this concept we call GIGO, which is G-I-G-O, garbage in, garbage out. Sometimes when you ask bad questions, you end up with bad answers. And of course, the survey is probably going to be a waste of your time if you end up with information that you can't use. So you want to make sure all of the data that you collect is as actionable as possible. So 
making sure that you write um, good questions and also good answer options can really make a difference. It's not just the wording, though. There's some technical pieces in there that can help. Um, so, of course, if you want to ask a question that should have only one answer, force someone to have only one answer. You want a single select question. You know, if I say, what is the top reason you signed up? It better be a single select question. Um, if you want to ask something that has multiple options, such as my example here, what do you think uh, when, these, uh, when you think of this business, which of these words come to mind? Think about how helpful it will be if somebody selects every single one of them. Like, uh, you know, maybe it's possible that I really do feel all of these things about this business, but making sure that um, you see that I've set answer constraints, which is a really great feature here, and a multi-select question type, select your top three choices. And so the platform isn't going to allow my participants to submit if they have more than three options. So at least three, uh, I'm sorry, at most three, you can set at least, at most, exactly. You can set the constraints that make sense to you, but this really requires my participants to narrow it down. So they can't just select all of them, they can't just be silly and check, 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 you know, without actually thinking about it. They need to put some thought into it, uh, which will give me much more, you know, reliable and useful data. So if I do know um, the answer options, as in this case, a single select question or multi-select question is great, rating scale, whatever it is, um, those kinds of responses will give a much better report. So I can say, you know, 90% of people gave us you know, satisfactory score, or, you know, 20% of people said that we were convenient. Whatever it is that you need to be able to say, um, those solid, concrete um, answer options really do give a better looking report. You can't make a graph um, or you can't make a chart out of um, open-ended questions. But if you're really not sure what people are going to give, you're not really sure about the appropriate answer options, you do want to give people an other option, or if you're just really not sure what they're going to say at all, maybe you're going to end up with a text box question, which is totally fine. Um, if you're not sure at all, you can, of course, do um, some analysis of your verbatim responses, the open-ended responses. You'll be able to see what frequency and what trends appear there. Um, but just keep in mind, if you want to be able to have some numbers, it brings us to our next point, um, that data can be its own reward as well. So again, rating I was just talking about. Um, when you set up a rating question, you know that there's a weight on the end. If you've got a scale, it's already built in. If you are adding a rating question such as this, this is a rating radio grid question, you'll be able to add those weights on the back end. So that tells me uh, when I have that weighting on the um, question itself, really, really useful. Um, it means that I'm going to be able to say not just, you know, 10% of people said, you know, let's make it positive. 10% of people said completely agree. Instead, I'm going to be able to say, if this is one, two, three, four, five, I'm going to say, on this scale, on average, we ended up, our customers gave us a 4.3. So super useful information, not just like lots of people said this, lots of people said this, some, few, hardly any. It's kind of informa good information to see in a bar graph, but it's also really nice to have a single number that says, overall, people gave us a 4.3 out of five, and that's a huge benefit. Um, from a rating type question. And the same thing is true of an NPS question. Net Promoter Score, if you're not familiar with it, um, is an extremely valuable question type. It's a standalone here by itself, a built-in 0 to 10 scale with this exact question. And NPS is a really great um, thing to be able to put out in your marketing materials and communication. They, our customers rated us, you know, 8 or 9 even. Let's not go crazy, but 10 would be nice. Um, uh, and an NPS score that's positive, a really nice thing to be able to say. Um, you know, of course, it's going to be converted more into a sort of percentage style, but uh, the more positive, the better, of course, is the idea. So when you take a look at um, other people who have NPS stats out there, um, it does look attractive to be able to have some numbers. Of course, if they're negative numbers, you might wait to, uh, you know, share them until you're able to improve them. But for your internal purposes, it can be very valuable. Um, it's not just sales that dictate how well a company is doing. Of course, that's important. But the more numbers you have, the more data you have. Of course, you, <laughs> of course you know that we're a little bit in favor of data collection because it's a really good um, way to be able to see the full picture of what's going on. If you don't know, uh, again, if you sort of have that open-ended question, like, is there anything else you'd like to tell us, please do try to use a you know, much more specific question than anything else. You know, asking, you know, is there anything that we could do to enhance quality of your experience while shopping in our store? That's a, a very specific question versus how was it? Um, so asking those specific questions 
Um, but they can be their own reward as well, those answers. It's when somebody gives you, you know, really juicy, nice, high-quality response that's in their own words, that is priceless. We love those too. The case studies, testimonials, um, you know, we, we, we love to hear them from everyone. And not everyone just reaches out and suddenly says, hey, you did a really great job on that. Um, or, you know, I really appreciated the support I received. Sometimes it goes a long way to ask. You know, it, it might sound like you're begging a little bit, like, please tell us, you know, how great we are. But in really you're saying, please tell us how we're doing. Um, so that testimonial can be really useful. If you are interested in sharing out that um, information that your customers are giving, be sure that you ask about sharing their names. You know, of course, you could set it up as an anonymous survey so they don't share any identifiable information. But some people might be happy to say, yes, I was involved in that. Yes, I've used this product. Um, I have good things to say about it. You know, maybe you'll end up on their website. Who knows? Um, you could provide a testimonial for them. But that's a really great um, opportunity to reach out to people because it's very hard to call all of your customers and say, hey, are you happy? Hey, are you happy? You know, it's much more effective to be able to um, follow up with those people who've said, you, who've already given you positive feedback. So we like the data. And last one here is the follow-up portion. Um, Again, there are a lot of uh, ways to look at this feedback. Of course, you've sent out the survey. A um, couple things that you can do, of course, for immediate follow-up, those instant notifications. You can see my example here is a, a rules and alerts condition that I have set up. You know, on our website, we have this nice test drive survey. And whenever anyone participates in it, I get to um, take a look at the results. I get notified right away. Um, and if there are certain actions, like you can request uh, follow-up, would you like someone to follow up with you? I get a separate alert for that as well, too. Um, and people who participate in that survey should get an instant thanks message. So all of our customers um, should be getting some interaction, not just a thank you on the screen when they complete the survey, but a follow-up as well. If there's something that you are expected to do on you know, the company side of things, that's fine. If it's something that you wanted to let them know after, you can send it right to them as well. So that's the immediate side of things. The second piece, of course, is something we say all the time. Report out your results. Where are you sharing this information? Is it a press release? Is it, you know, if this is a major initiative that you're putting out, maybe this is the first time you've ever done a customer satisfaction survey. Maybe you don't want to say it's the first time ever, but um, maybe you're interested in sharing out those results with your customers, with your uh, employees, with, you know, board members, whoever it is, letting them know this is where we are, um, and then figuring out what are you going to do about it. You know, there has got to be some key takeaways that you've noticed, some insights you've um, uncovered within that project. So what are you going to do about it? Um, sounds a little bit like a challenge. What are you going to do about it? A little bit of a challenge. But the idea is, like, of course you should be doing something about it. Otherwise, why did you ask? That's why you spent all of that time making sure that your questions were going to give you actionable results. Um, so letting customers know what you've done, asking for their feedback. You know, if we said, you know, based on your feedback, we understand that people want more question types. And so we've given you the following, for example, in our last release, four new question types, pretty great. Um, and what do you think of those? You know, sometimes people will say, perfect, that's exactly what I wanted, thumbs up. And sometimes people will say, of course, well, it's not exactly what I had in mind. Or some <laughs> people will say, we want a lot more question types, keep it coming. So knowing that you're on the right track um, is really valuable. It's not that, like I said earlier, it's not that this conversation will ever end. If those are your customers. You're providing them some product, some service. You're helping them out. And the idea is that you want to be able to learn from them so they continue to be your customers. So you build that loyalty and retention as well. But these are the high-level points. I know that's uh, a lot of time on the high-level points before getting into the platform, but that's what happens when you get high-level. So. I wanted to take a quick look into the survey bank as well as to answer any questions that anyone has. I don't have a you know formal set of activities that I need to show you here, but I just wanted to run through uh, within the survey bank what it would look like to choose um, a customer survey as well and start to um, do some of those things that we've talked about. I'm just going to go directly into the survey bank here. Of course, I could go to create a survey. Just go straight to the survey bank because I know that's where I'm going. And if you do have any questions, please feel free to ping me as I'm going through this quick process. So here under customer surveys, we see we have a pretty good set of those that are in here for now. Um, I'll just start with the one that's on top, which is the customer retention survey. All I need to do, I could preview it, I could download it. I'm going to make a copy directly into my account. So now it's in the shared folder of my account. So then when I click over here to folders, or I could bond back up to the top to the design section, I will see under shared, 
it's available there for me right now. So probably a I would like a nicer looking title than this, but for our purposes today, I'll just dive right in and take a look at this survey. So of course the survey is coming from the survey bank. So it's not a bad looking survey. It's pretty nice. I've reviewed it myself. I think it's okay. But um, the looks department, if that was the first part that I was starting out with branding, um, I might need to, <laughs> I might need to uh, put a little effort in here. So it's a nice looking template to start with, but um, under uh, we have a few options here. First of all, right on this screen, I can put my logo in here. Strongly recommend for customer surveys that you are using an account logo, um, something that you've uploaded in settings up here. That way you're using your same brand consistently. And if you do decide to um, change your logo down the road, um, please do make sure that you update that account logo so people are seeing it um, regularly and consistently. Um, the other quick visual piece that I'd like to do here is changing up the template. So I'd like it to be a little bit prettier, <laughs> no doubt, and I'd like it to match my logo. So um, I could change any different uh, color schemes that I'd like here, change the template entirely. This one's probably fine. Um, I can get a little bit carried away with width, medium, narrow. I'll just leave it as narrow for right now. Any of these pieces that I'd like to change, I absolutely can change. Um, just show you, it gets a little fancy when we get into the background side of things. If you really want to um, make your brand as clear and present um, to all of your users, you could make it as a background image. Um, it could be tiled, it could be, um, it could be uh, just the full page, anything that you like. So if you have <laughs> something that you find here already, who knows what your service or your company is if you uh, are using this background, but a lot of different options that you have here. He's running around children. Um, I'll go back to the one that I chose as my example earlier. So you can um, update that background if you like. You can decide, okay, now I'm using this background. I think I'm going to uh, change the transparency of that background so it'll be easier for people to see. And of course that preview is just on the right-hand side. Um, of course I could change um, the color of any of the text that I'd like. Maybe I'll make them all black for now. But you get the idea here. I'm going to go ahead and save this one. Do save it as a template for future use. So I'm going to call this the Customer Retention Survey. So all of them, all of my uh, future customer retention surveys or all of my customer surveys, for example, I might want to use exactly this template. So that when I preview it again, I'll be able to restart this one be able to see that new template load. So I can decide if this is too gray for me or if I'd like a different background. Of course, in this case, it makes perfect sense for me to have something about data because this ours at SoGo Survey um, as the topic, but you want something that reflects your brand. Not just that it's so pretty, that it's distracting, but that it complements your topic, that it has something to do uh, with what you're talking about. Um, on the market side of things, here you'll see that I'm starting to drill down on my uh, market segment. In this case, maybe I don't know the information. I already mentioned pre-population. Um, of course, I need to customize my template here. But in that um, pre-populated field, if I already knew um, what was going to be happening here, if I already knew the, um, uh, the packages, for example, or any demographic details about my um, customers, I could go ahead and customize that here. So the quickest way to do that is by getting into uh, for example, I might even know this one. So under more, I will see data population, and then I'll see all of those answer options here. Um, so again, if I already know this information, I might decide to add it in there and make it hidden. Totally fine if you already know that. Your customers are probably aware that you know some information about them. You can hide that in there. Um, but really useful in order to give you a little bit more quality data, making sure that you're tracking things that you already know from the beginning to the end. If you don't know certain information um, and you do need to ask it, it could be product or service, it could be you know, what first prompted you to buy from this business, for example, you might decide to introduce some logic. So if somebody answers this, then they'll go to the next question. So you might be very interested in exploring um, question display logic or even um, branching as well. So you can learn a little bit more about those features here, but in short, just for the moment, question display logic is going to allow you to ask a quick follow-up question. So for example, if somebody chooses, I saw an advertisement, your follow-up question might be, where did you see an advertisement? You know, was it online? Was it in print? Was it on the radio? 
Um, so those quick follow-up questions, question display logic is a perfect option for. Branching is going to be a best, their best choice if you um, have a series of additional questions to ask. So for example, if you said, um, if somebody said, I researched online, maybe you want to ask them a whole page of questions of, you know, what were your search terms? What features were most important for you when you were looking? Um, so a couple different questions, and only people who give this question or give this response will see those, those questions on that, uh, you know, second or third page that you set up for branching. So really great ways to drill down to learn more about your market if you don't already know. I've already mentioned as well, too, um, the idea of setting up answer constraints, so I want to show that one. Um, I can do it up here because this one is a multi-select question. Um, I've got a couple more questions here, too, and this is the one that I'd already applied it to, so select your top three choices. So I would just want to show you how that um, answer constraint would work on here. You'll see uh, all of your options here, and this is for a multi-select question. Answer constraints is available there on the left-hand side. Remember I said that you had a few different options. Um, at the most, or at least, or a little bit more generous, exactly. Um, it, they must actually answer exactly three before they move on. So it's a little bit more flexible if you say um, at the most, let's say, and you can set that constraint. You can also customize the message there too. So all of the content that you have um, is available uh, is available to be edited. So really great question type to be able to use. Um, the other one on the sort of answers working for themselves, rating scales by themselves, and I'll also take a look at um, my grid here. So in my grid, I have a rating scale. Again, this goes to data that will be useful for you. When you are using those rating, rating questions, please do make sure that you include a weight here. You'll see the same thing on a rating scale. Um, and that's where, even though it looks like an extra field, like yes, you are going to see the word neutral. No, you won't necessarily see the number three. But number three is collected on the back end. So collecting all of that back end data for rating questions, as well as questions like uh, net promoter score where it's already built in, you're already collecting that data, um, very, very useful for you. When you get to those open-ended text box questions, of course we'd like to hear from everybody. Uh, what do they do right, for example, could be the question you're asking, and this would be your chance to collect some of that testimonial data. Um, if you are concerned that people are going to take a little too much space, you might decide, okay, well, I'm going to give them only, you know, 1,000 characters or 100 characters um, to make their responses a little bit more pithy. You can also decide that you'd like to have them see how many characters are remaining um, and even control the size of the text box too if you'd like. You know, <laughs> hopefully for this one you're adding a lot of space because you're assuming that your business does some nice things. Um, but keep in mind it's a little bit of a disconnect if you have, um, you know, this business what does it do right is a very big box, and what could it improve is a very small box. So you want to make sure that you set some consistency there as you set your expectations. Okay, so a lot of other points that we've talked about today, getting a little bit further on in the design process. Um, of course, once your survey is set up very nicely, um, you'll be able to move on to distribution that matches your survey. You'll be able to look at reports that are based on the quality data that you've come up with. You'll be able to do things like set instant thanks and rules and alerts, like I've mentioned before. Um, and those are available up here at the top from the design portion of the platform. So I want to stop here. I know, again, like I said, we've got a lot more um, things that we could talk about on any of these topics, but I wanted to just have an overview of some of the key pieces that might be most valuable to reflect on while you're building your customer surveys. So if you do have any questions for me, I'd be happy to take them now. And if not, that is not a problem. Of course, I'll be sending you this recording. I'd be happy to follow up with you. If you have any questions about any of the specific features, of course, that we've talked about today, you can access our complete user guide up in the top right-hand corner of your screen. Check in on reasonable recent videos, uh, relevant, excuse me, <laughs> they're also reasonable videos that are up here in the top of your screen um, to drill down on any of the features that we've learned more about today. Seeing no questions, I will take that as a sign that you've gotten everything that you need. And if not, you know where to find me. Again, my name is Melissa, and I will look forward to following up with you after this call. Uh, thank you for your time, and best wishes with your next customer survey.